Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is January 19th, 2019. In this week's uh, video, I plan on answering some reader questions. I will have uh, some conversation at the end of the video about the recent developments in the oil market. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to remind uh, everybody out there about uh, the newsletter I publish, Actionable Intelligence. Um, the things that I talk about in these videos uh, are manifested into investment and speculative ideas in the newsletter. Uh, the goal of the newsletter is to take advantage of asymmetric opportunities. Uh, that's uh, opportunities in contrarian and blown out industries, countries, asset classes. Uh, we're looking for uh, maximum upside with very little downside. So if you're interested in actually speculating in particular names or ideas, that we talk about in these videos, I encourage you to click on the link and uh, you can take a subscription uh, to that uh, newsletter. I also have a Patreon uh, page. Uh, people choose to support me in my work on these videos. What I like to offer people is if you will support me at $5 per month, because it is a monthly uh, support, I will give you the current month's actionable intelligence alert uh, stock pick and you can get a flavor of the type of writing that we do there and the ideas uh, that will give you a sample and clue to, as to what we're doing as to whether you want to take a subscription to the newsletter so those are I uh, just wanted to advertise those at the start of the uh, of the pod of the video don't want to drone on about that stuff um, but I do uh, get quite a bit of questions uh, occasionally I like to talk about some of them. Uh, for some reason, I'm getting a lot of questions about gold recently. So that will be the first uh, thing that we'll talk about. Um, my feelings on gold. I own gold. Uh, I own a substantial amount of gold. Uh, I have it in bullion form in secure location. Uh, I own gold and I look at gold as a form of insurance. Just like you'd have insurance on your car, just like you'd have insurance on your house. I have insurance for my portfolio and for my life. Now, that's a provocative statement, and I'm known for making provocative statements, but let me say this. Uh, in a world of constant turmoil and not being able to predict the future, uh, I don't exist in a bubble of normalcy bias. And what I mean by that is I don't just assume that everything tomorrow will be the same as today just because yesterday was uh, like today. Um, things change. That's the history of man. Empires come and go. Countries come and go. Political environments and uh, come and go. I will tell you that there are many stories of Jews that were in Germany in the late 20s and early 30s that never saw the rise of National Socialism. Uh, people that had foresight left the country. And even at near the end, before the deportations began, uh, there was still time to leave, and many a people used gold, diamonds, or some other hard asset to buy their way out of uh, their certain doom and destruction. Now, that doesn't mean that I suggest that uh, that's going to happen here, but we have many stories, even in recent times, of South American currency collapses, uh, what's going on in Venezuela right now, uh, what has happened many times in Argentina, and we have story after story of people that have preserved their wealth and been able to get themselves out of sticky situations because they had the foresight to accumulate some hard assets. So that's what I look at gold as. There are many people out there saying, well, gold's going to go to 5000 or gold's going to go to $10,000 an ounce. And, you know, they have visions of sugar plums and retirements in Bali. Uh, I can tell you that if gold, I don't want to live in a country where gold's $10,000 an ounce. I can assure you that probably won't be good. So therefore, I don't buy gold bullion as a way to speculate by getting higher profits. Like I said, it's insurance. Um, a lot of people will poo-poo gold because it hasn't went anywhere, but they don't really understand the concept of gold. And I kind of have a quote here uh, from Ray Dalio, who is a very famous hedge fund manager, very wealthy person, very intelligent person. Um, and he was giving a speech or a talk to a group of uh, swells, if you will. 
And he was asked about this. Do you own gold? And he said, yes, I own gold and I own a good percentage of gold in my portfolio. And people were snickering and laughing. I'll put a link to the video in the show notes. And he made the comment, which has stuck with me and I agree with. He said to the group that was snickering at him, uh, him being a billionaire successful hedge fund manager, by the way, he said, if you don't own gold, you do not understand history or economics. So let's talk a little bit about that. What is the history of, of the world? Is government destruction of currencies to maintain power? So, I mean, let's look at the current situation in Venezuela. You know, we had a very wealthy country uh, that did have uh, inequality in, in wealth, and we had a socialist government take over, and over time, uh, basically squandered all the wealth in the country, dissipated the wealth in the country, and now has resorted to just printing money. So now you have the one of the worst hyperinflations in the history of the world going on there. What do you have? You have poverty. You have hunger. You have people with no medical attention. You have riots. You have uh, dictatorial powers being taken on by the government. This is the history of currency debasement. I mean, if you look at the Roman Empire, what did they do? I mean, they were on a gold, gold silver standard. So what did they do as, they, as the empire expanded and it became more corrupt and the spending got out of control? They started clipping the coins. They started shaving the gold and silver, uh, making the coins smaller, and uh, they could make more coins. Well, it's just that's inflation. You know, inflation isn't rising prices. Rising prices are a manifestation of the inflation, which is creating more currency units out of thin air. So... To disabuse people of any idea that that can't happen here, it's exactly what's happening here and will happen here. Um, the United States uh, is uh, had already had one failed currency in its history. The Continental uh, was the original currency of the colonies, uh, 13 states, if you will. And what did they do when they were in their war with Great Britain? They inflated, printed these things out of uh, thin air and basically debase them into worthlessness. I mean, that's there was a term back in those days called, you know, worth, worth less than a continental. So uh, uh, this has happened before, it will happen again. Typically, the inflations come about as a result of wars because countries like to go to war, and they can't pay for them. Um, what we have in the United States, though, is a big empire that has basically been at wars for somewhere around the world for the last 80 or 90 year, 100 years. So um, we cannot pay for these things. We have huge social uh, problems and issues that are manifesting themselves here in the next 20 or 30 years. And what that is, is basically 100 to $200 trillion in unfunded liabilities that the federal government has taken on. What am I talking about? Social Security, Medicare, government pensions, all these liabilities that they have put put the people of the United States on the hook for, they cannot be paid for. Um, balance that against a current federal debt of $21 trillion and a current deficit each year of a, a, a baked in of a trillion dollars. I mean, how does it, you know, this is where I get back to the normalcy bias and psychology and the fact that most people are idiots. Um, just because something isn't happening right now doesn't mean it's not going to happen. I mean, that's how p countries and people go broke. I mean, there was a famous uh, saying that I like to use out of one of Ernest Hemingway's books. I can't even remember the character. I have to go look it up. But uh, the two gentlemen were lamenting about things over drinks, I believe in a bar. One of the guys had, current, had went bankrupt, and the other friend asked him, how did you go bankrupt? And he said, slowly, and then, uh, then all of a sudden. And that's what happens. I mean, these structural imbalances, these debts, they pile up over time. And as long as you can pay the interest, it's not a big deal. And then at some point, the debt becomes so large that it cannot be paid. And if you look back through history, what do governments do? They just start printing currency and paying for them. They will destroy the currency. You know, so we have, you know, this is why I rail against these nitwits and these nincompoops like, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, in her $30 trillion green energy uh, New Deal. And, you know, she has no idea how to pay for it. And she said, hey, we can just print the money. Sure, why not? You know, you can just print wealth into, you know, let's just, you know, this is the same idea I have against minimum wages and all these fantasies that these people have. Real wealth is hard to create. 
You can't just drink a bunch of monster drinks and create an app in 18 hours and you're in business. You can't just turn on the printing presses and create things out of nothing. And this is why I rail against this. And I don't get too upset. You sound, you hear me being aggravated. It's going to happen. It's not going to be changed. Most people are idiots. Most people are stupid. I use stupid not as a pejorative, but as a clinical term. The inability to see the consequences far in the future of current actions. That's what stupidity is. That's why most people don't have two nickels to rub together and don't even most of these people don't even own the underwear they're wearing. They just do not get it, okay? And when you stand up there as a pot, we're seeing a rise in populism. Uh, we're seeing this d discussion around more about egalitarianism, equality, all these other things of outcomes. Um, that can only be done through violence and government ac uh, action. And most people aren't going to give up their wealth uh, voluntarily, so you can always print. You know, Bernanke was asked about this um, unfunded liabilities by Ron Paul, I mean, back when he was Fed, Fed chairman. And, and Bernanke said it very smart, smartly. He said, listen, the U.S. dollar or the U.S. government has this thing called a printing press. These liabilities for Social Security and Medicare will be paid. However, I cannot guarantee the value of the dollars that they'll be paid in. I mean, this is, an, this is what he said. I mean, if you don't get it, why you need to own some gold, you're not going to get it. So that's my view on gold. Um, when I say that I own gold, I mean actual gold bullion in your possession. What am I talking about gold bullion? I'm talking about maple leaves, uh, eagles, uh, the um, Krugerrands is my favorite. And you can buy these at any coin shop. You can buy these in various denominations like uh, one ounce, half ounce, quarter ounce. I suggest buying the one ounce coins. Um, and you can get these. You do not want to be getting sucked into numismatic, which I mean coin collecting, uh, because that's a whole other thing. You just want to buy the standard one ounce gold bullion with a very little spread between the coin cost and the actual gold uh, spot price. And this is very easy to do online or at your local coin shop. I would suggest you do that. If you're a low budget guy, buy silver rounds. Buy American Eagle silver rounds. You can buy them in, uh, you know, any, any one coin, 100 coins. You can buy what's called the Monster Box. I think it's 100 coins directly from the uh, U.S. Mint. So I suggest that people have this for an insurance. I mean, I'm, I'm not predicting the, you know, fallout of the United States in the next year or two, but at some point something's going to happen and you're going to want that protection. You know, when the stock market goes down massively, initially gold goes down, but it has a tendency to outperform during those times. So I look at it as a hedge against government, against the unknown, against, you know, uh, basically the inability to forecast the future. That's what I look at it as. Okay, gold stocks, let's talk about those because that's what everybody really cares about, I guess, in this video. That's what I think most of the questions are about. Gold stocks are not insurance, they're speculations. Um, mining, especially gold mining, sucks as a business. It's really horseshit. Um, all kind of things can go wrong from getting the mine permitted, financed, actually getting the thing built, then getting into production. You get all kinds of problems from that. It's very low margin, plus you're a price taker. That means you have to take the price of the commodity uh, you know, when you start the whole di idea of building the mine, it might make sense because gold was, you know, eighteen or nineteen hundred dollars an ounce a few years ago, and then all of a sudden the gold price goes to twelve hundred, and you're in the middle of building this thing, and is it really worth it? So, I tremendous amount of money can be made if you catch a gold stock bull market. However, that's very difficult to do. So, one of the things that I like about mining is, and how to take advantage of it is, I like royalty companies. And royalty companies, I've explained this before, basically give money to a mining company and the mining company gives them a percentage of the, uh, off the top of the revenue from the mine, whether it's one, two, three percent, or they may sometimes make other arrangements where they actually deliver a certain amount of gold or silver to the royalty company at a reduced price. 
There's all types of arrangements that can be made. And the reason I like this is because the risk is a lot smaller or, or, or de minimis uh, as opposed to the mining company. I mean, you have in a royalty company maybe a dozen people working for you and you contract out you know, your geological reviews and all that stuff. You're just a bunch of finance guys sitting around in an office. If you have very high margins and lower risk, yet you still have the upside of if you do have a gold bull market, you get the upside. Now, you won't get the 10 and 20 to 1 moonshots, but, uh, you know, you get exposure and you also get something what I call optionality. And what optionality is, is what my hero Pierre Lassonde, who started Franco Nevada, which is the largest gold mining royalty company, he said this many times, and this is what I like about it about what uh, the optionality portion of investing in royalty companies. Basically, what's the optionality? So I get a royalty with XYZ Mining Company, and as part of the royalty, I might actually put a clause in the contract that says, any adjoining properties around the mine that you find additional gold in, I get a royalty on that too. So, you know, that may or may not be happen, but, you know, from a geologic, geological perspective, the best place to find a mineral is probably right next to a mineral mine. So uh, it doesn't always happen that way, but it does often does happen that way. So, you know, it's like uh, Pierre Lassonde said, you know, if you have a million or two million acres under option, uh, at some point you just get lucky, don't you? So uh, I agree with that. So that's another upside for royalty companies. That's why I like them. So that's my ideas about gold. Uh, my ideas are a lot more um, uh, not in the mainstream, I know that, but uh, I look out in the future and I don't see positive things for the U.S. empire. And I see these, uh, I actually wrote an article about Social Security and Medicare ultimately destroying the United States as a political entity. I'll put a, put a uh, it's a very provocative article and it will piss a lot of people off, but I don't really care. Uh, that's what I see happening. I mean, I don't wish these things to happen. I mean, I wish that people would have physical responsibility and do the right thing and learn from past history, but that's just not the case. The, there's nothing new under the sun, and you know, people have the idea that uh, they can get something for nothing just by voting. So as long as that idea sticks in people's minds, uh, we're in for currency debasement, and that's why I like gold. Another question I got was, do I still like Mongolia? Um, I have a love-hate relationship with Mongolia. Um, I kind of understand the potential of Mongolia. I mean, it's a country of 3 million people. It's probably sitting on multi-trillions of dollars of worth of mineral assets, anywhere from coal, thermal and metallurgical, copper, uranium, gold, feldspar, has a huge agricultural animal husbandry potential. As a matter of fact, they had record meat exports from Mongolia this year. The problem with Mongolia is <clears throat> they're, they're kind of a victim of their own success, if you will. What do I mean by that? You know, at one point, the Mongolians controlled, I mean, this is going back hundreds of years, of course, vast swaths of the earth. I mean, they were Genghis Khan. We all know that. I think one out of every 60 people in that part of the world has some type of... Uh, Genghis Khan or one of his descendants' uh, genetic material in their DNA. So they're very prolific people. They were very proud people. But now they're just a country of 3 million people. And they're kind of landlocked between Russia and China. And they're very nationalistic. They're very populist thinking. And, you know, it's a young democracy. It was the, one of the first communist countries besides Russia when the, you know, they were the, one of the first places to turn communist after Russia during the Rus after the Ref Russian Revolution. They also had that legacy that they had to throw off when they declared independence in 1990 and had democratic elections. It's been very tumultuous uh, through that time. So basically, you know, they've, I don't want to get into the whole history. Suffice to say that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, walking around, it seems, just reaching out blind, leading the blind, if you will. I mean, they have all this mineral wealth. There's a lot of corruption there. There's a lot of jockeying for positions. There's a lot of fam few families, a couple dozen, that are very well off, that control a lot of stuff there. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, it holds back the development of the country, let's put it that way. 
I'll give you an example. There are tremendous in the Tavan Tolgoi coal fields, which are basically literally right near the Chinese border. Uh, there's all kinds of coal exports to China for steel making and thermal coal. This has been going on there's, uh, for years. They've been digging the coal up and transporting it in trucks. You know, it costs a tremendous amount of money to transport the coal to the border in these trucks. I mean, there's, there was articles last year where some of the lines at the um, customs stations were, you know, 100 miles long or something like this. It's like, okay, well, why don't you just build a railroad? Well, they've been talking about doing that for over 10 years. And it just continues to get, you know, caught up in this whole political uh, goofiness that goes on in Ulaanbaatar. You know, you hear everything from, well, should we have Chinese gauge rails or Russian gauge rails to, if you put a railroad in, the Chinese could, you know, use that if they ever invade us. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, a crack air, air... Born division or brigade could take over Ulaanbaatar in about 30 minutes. I mean, they're not going to use a railroad to take you over. So this is a kind of stupid stupidity. And again, stupid being a clinical term, not being able to see the consequences in the future of decisions made today. So I would say that things are slowly changing. Um, they're going through, like I said, these uh, maturity pains. Uh, I think, I believe in the long-term viability of the place. And, you know, they are, they did have record coal exports this year. They did have record copper and gold exports. Um, the mine, the gold, uh, copper mine in Oyutolgoi, which is run by Rio Tinto, is on the border. Um, the surface workings, they have an open pit. They are working on underground workings. And I mentioned that in another um, slide. I'll get into that. But uh, all these things are right, literally on the border. I mean, I remember having a conversation when I was there with a Rio Tinto executive in a bar, and he's saying, look, I mean, it's a lot bigger than people think. We're just, we just haven't told, every, it, it hasn't been fully uh, explored, let's put it that way, you know, because then they kind of understood what would happen if the full potential in the Mongolian government understood that. Suffice to say, there's trillions of dollars of wealth there. Uh, my view is it will be developed. Uh, it'll be in fits and starts. But over time, I, I believe in the in the potential there, and I'm I have a lot of investments there, by the way. Um, you know, at one point in 2011, it was the fastest growing economy in the world. It grew 17 percent in one year. I was there during that time. It was like you read about in these books, like what London was like probably in the 18 in 1800, and what you know um, New York was like in 1900. It was really bustling. There was a lot of deal making. It was really it was entrepreneurial. I mean, it was really exciting. Uh, I'm glad I got to see that, you know, um, obviously they had some issues, the economy kind of collapsed and needed an IMF bailout, but currently the economy's grown around 6%. And what people need to understand is when you're sitting on trillions of dollars of wealth that needs to be developed, there's a lot of potential there. I mean, you have to understand something. The economy of Fargo, North Dakota is around 13 or $14 billion. That's just a city in the United States in some rinky dink state in North Dakota. I mean, the whole country of Mongolia's GDP is slightly less than the city of Fargo, North Dakota's. And Fargo's not sitting on trillions of dollars of wealth. So that's my point. There's a tremendous amount of potential. I eventually think it'll be unlocked. And the key to the unlocking, I think, is coming soon, or the catalyst, if you will. And that's the uh, Oyu Tolgoi mine in southern Mongolia. I guess it's already in production via an open pit. Uh, Rio Tinto basically controls this. And... Um, but only 20% of the mineral wealth is contained in the open pit. 80% of the mine's wealth is in the underground expansion, which is going on currently. And that's supposed to come online in 2021. I will give credit to Rio Tinto. They are on budget on time. Uh, they seem to be making good progress. I mean, they know how to mine, so I expect this thing to come online. When it does, the economy of Mongolia will go up by a third almost instantaneously. Um, the thing I like about copper is current copper price is down, obviously, but many analysts and many people are saying that there has been tremendous underinvestment, like there has been in a lot of commodities around copper, and that we are looking at a copper shortage over the next few years, which is going to possibly take the price of copper to all-time highs. Um, that is kind of why I'm invested in Mongolia. I don't, I think, look at it as a potential to get the spillover effects of a copper boom 
and how that will take place in the real estate and other things that I'm invested in in Mongolia. So um, that's my thinking, uh, specifically around the continued electrification of emerging and frontier markets, the electrification of our transportation infrastructure as we transition to electric vehicles over the coming decades. And that is really blowing up. People are not paying attention to what's going on in China. There is rapid electrification of the transportation sector in China. Um, look at the Goring and Rosenschwag uh, um, blog that I put up about the electrification of rural India, kind of similar to what went on in China as far as how that could single-handedly drive world copper demand and pricing. So, um, like I said, I think, you know, a rising standard of living in Mongolia, which will be a spillover effect of the copper boom that I think that we're going to see over the next few years, will lead to the emergence and growth of a large middle class. Obviously, when you're in the middle class and you're young, you have a propensity to spend. You can see how the thinking goes out into housing, children, all that stuff. So um, that's my thinking on Mongolia. Yes, I am bullish on it over the next couple of years. So let's talk about oil. Uh, back around the holidays, I didn't pick the exact bottom. I don't want to say that I did. We got it close though. Um, you know, 100 million barrels a day in demand is not viable at $46 a barrel. We, that's what we said. I don't know what the equilibrium price right now is of oil. We have so many plates in the air with the OPEC cuts, with all the trade discussions, with all of the... Uh, ideas about a slowing world economy, a slowing U.S. economy, that meaning lower oil demand. So we're going to have to see over the next few months where the equilibrium price is for oil. I suggest it's probably in the mid-60s, but I do not know that for a fact. I will say, though, that I was able to top up a lot of my oil-related investments. I mean, we saw some stocks selling at, I'll give you one example, Schlumberger, which is the largest oil field services company. They do everything. They've been around for a hundred years. They have done, they do everything in an oil field for servicing. And that stock w was recently selling at a 25 year low. Now, when you can buy the best company in the industry at a 25 year low, I mean, you, you, your downside is really limited and your upside is uh, looking pretty good. And of course the stock is already recovering. Um, this is a price, of, the, the chart here shows a price of oil, WTA, um, West Texas Intermediate. Um, it's been in an uptrend. I suspect it's probably getting, going to be getting overbought soon, but um, I'm not saying we're in a bull market again. Like I said, we need to find the equilibrium price. We just don't know where it's at after this uh, crash that we had over the last uh, three or four months. So I will say that uh, one of the stocks I mentioned to a couple people, I might have mentioned it on the uh, podcast. I don't own this stock. I have owned it in the past, but somebody asked me to give them a, you know, stock. So I gave them this. I mean, Vermillion, this top-notch operator, has assets all over the world, uh, very well capitalized, very high dividend, and you can see it's already recovered nicely uh, off the lows. As the oil price goes up, this stock has been moving higher. So you've seen this all throughout the oil patch. Um, particularly interested, like I said before, in the offshore oil industry and offshore oil services industry. That's where we have a lot of our uh, holdings uh, or take, trying to take advantage of in the portfolio. Um, but they were selling at uh, prices I had never seen, even when I thought that it was already undervalued. So this is the whole, the reason I'm bringing it up is the whole gist around, the whole discussion around contrarian investing. When oil was at 46 on Christmas Eve, the last day of trading, everybody was freaking out. We're, I was buying. What were you doing? Did you actually, some people were telling me on the comment section, well, oil's going to $25 a barrel. Okay. Based on what? I mean, at some point, the sediment gets so bad that everybody that wants to sell has sold. And then you have to go back up because there's no more sellers. And at 100 million barrels a day of demand, that's 3 billion barrels a month. That's almost 40 billion barrels a year of oil production and growing at one and a, one to one and a half percent a year with depletion. I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars need to, I've said this ad nauseum, the, the investment has not been there to maintain for demand. 
And I would suggest that uh, at some point that's going to manifest itself. So you know the story if you've been listening to me for a while. Uh, bullish on s- several of these commodities. Don't have time to talk about uranium. Not much has happened there. But uh, you can still buy yellow cake and uranium participation at pretty good discounts in that asset value. So if you haven't, uh, if you're interested in uranium, you should be buying that physical uranium and getting it at a discount. So that's all I'll say about that. Well, that's uh, that's it for this week, guys. Uh, appreciate the comments. Pre- appreciate the support. Channel continues to grow. Hit that like button. Hit that bell. Uh, appreciate the support. I le- love the comments. Love the interaction with you guys. Let's keep it going. A lot of you guys email me stuff, and I look at it all. I try to answer all the emails. Uh, if I haven't got back to you, it's not because I uh, don't want to. It's just because of a timing thing. So, again, appreciate the support. And we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, guys.